Well, as we have mentioned over the past few weeks, we are planning to stay online for worship uh, through the end of June, but we'll hopefully be able to move to in-person worship early in the month of July. We appreciate your patience as we are trying to navigate uh, this time that has been so confusing and, and so uncertain. And so we, again, are so grateful for you joining us through virtual worship, and we are hoping, we are longing uh, to be able to gather soon. Uh, We are still gathering in person on Sunday evenings at 6 here in the parking lot of the church, and we would love to see you uh, this evening. Uh, We would love to say Happy Father's Day uh, to the dads in our church and to spend a few moments reconnecting and seeing each other in person. So you can join us this evening at 6. Most of our Bible studies and small groups are on break for the summer. Our women's Bible studies are still meeting, and so you can find information on that on our website or in the email newsletter. I'm sure they would love to have new people join them even in this time. I also want to remind you that you are still able to give to Walnut Creek and support our ministry uh, through online giving or through good old-fashioned snail mail as well. And we are so grateful for how you have been faithful to support our church during this time. Uh, this morning, Steve Hilkema is going to preach for us. Grateful for Steve's ministry as a hospice chaplain. I'm grateful for his ministry in our congregation. And he is always so generous with his time and with his energy and willing to step in to give uh, Steve and I a break. And so, Steve Hilkema, would you come and share God's word with us this morning? Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan and Steve just finished up their series on Acts, and they're going to be jumping in, I believe, as well into Proverbs here as we go through the summer. And I thought I would take first shot and grab the ones that they, that they wanted, so they'd have to come up with a different message. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is really a life passage for us. For Susan and myself, it was uh, our passage that we chose for our wedding, and when I had the opportunity to uh, marry Katie and Nick, I chose that passage as well. Here it is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Well, 2020 has been anything but a straight path. It's been quite a journey. In fact, I think we could call it epic. And with that in mind, I turned a month or so ago to an epic journey in book form. I turned to The Lord of the Rings. Figured if I needed to go through uh, this pandemic and everything else, I wanted to uh, uh, spend some time in some fantasy, spend some time in an epic journey where I could kind of leave this world and yet still be a part of it. A favorite line of mine in all of the Lord of the Rings is when Frodo and Gandalf are talking to each other, and Frodo says, I wish this ring had never come to me. And in the movie, they place that right when they're in the midst of the mines of Moria. They are just coming from this avalanche of snow. They're in the dark. They don't know where they're going. And they, he and Gandalf have this conversation. In the book, it's actually very much right at the beginning as they understand what this ring is that Bilbo gave to Frodo. And he says, I wish it had never come to me. And Gandalf says these incredible words, so do all who live to see such times. But that's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that's given us. There are forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to have it. And that's an encouraging thought. There are forces at work in this world, and yet here we are. And in some real ways, for each one of us today. That is an encouraging thought. 
This time was not for us to decide. It was thrust upon us. And what are we going to do with that time? There's so much of my life that is wrapped up in those words. I'm on a journey. It has been anything but straight. And it was brought home to me just over a couple of weeks. Number one, I was reintroduced to my chaplain in college, Jerry Sitzer. He wrote a book, A Grace Disguised. It was about the loss and the grief that he experienced in an accident, a car accident, in which three generations of women in his life were instantly taken from him. So we caught up, and immediately we start kind of talking about life. And I gave him some highlights, maybe even some lowlights. Struggles that we've had as a family with health needs, traumatic situations, myriad losses that we've experienced as we've pastored and been a part of life, traumatic situations, uh, job losses, financial struggles, all sorts. But also then the highlights, the gifts that we've received, the friends, the work, the blessings. And then I mentioned in passing that... uh, I've done uh, a few marathons in my time. Thought he'd like that. He's a runner as well. And his response to me was this. You've been running more than one kind of marathon, Steve. Your life has been a marathon. So full of challenge and affliction, which has required resilience. And he said, I too learned a thing or two about resilience after the accident. Now, there's nothing special about my life. Your life has been about resilience as well. It's a very important and impactful word for him. In fact, he just wrote a book entitled Resilient Faith. So he's looking for it every time he has a conversation with somebody about how their life has been resilient. And he's been supportive and encouraging to so many people. Resilience. I picked up a, uh, a YouTube a video from Tim Keller and was listening to that. And he was talking about how we address our own self-care in the midst of this pandemic. And he remembered back to a time when he was pastoring in New York City after 9-11. And a pastor friend of his who was pastoring in Oklahoma City gave him some advice about how to take care of himself. Remember, the Oklahoma City bombing was in 1995. It was only six short years until we had the, world, uh, the uh, 9-11 bombings. His second point was resilience without stoicism, as he was talking. And there's that word again, resilience. And so I started looking uh, For my work uh, as a hospice chaplain, we've been doing uh, daily devotions. I was looking at so many of the devotions I put together, and I looked back and said, these have a lot to do with resilience, uh, working with families, touching the lives of nursing home administrators and staff. So what do I preach on today? This allows me an opportunity to do even a little bit more reflection. What does it mean for us in the light of all of what what we've been going through to live a life of resilience. Well, what is resilience? The quality of being able to adapt to stressful life changes and bouncing back from hardships. Resilience is a response to tragedy, crisis, or other life-altering changes that allows us to move on despite a loss. It does not mean that we are unaffected or uncaring about the life change. Rather, resilience is the human heart's ability to suffer greatly and to grow from it nationally. We can look back to 9-11, to other situations. We don't have to look back far with COVID-19, with, with racial tensions. Personally, we can look at our lives, the, the sicknesses, the hardships, the handicaps, the deaths, the losses, the economic downturns. And then Gandalf's words come back to us. What do we do with the time that is given us? Resilience for me has come down to who is it that I'm going to listen to? 
How is it that I'm going to be able to adapt to life changes? And who am I going to listen to as I am making my way through my journey in life? And so we have Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. There's a lot of parallelisms that take place in the Proverbs. Uh, this could be probably split up any number of ways in parallels. But I just want us to, to think more in that ABBA type of a thought process today. What does it mean to listen to ourselves? That's the B side. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, what are you going to be doing? And then the A side is trusting in the Lord and he will make your paths straight. First, when I listened to my understanding, what takes place? We like to be able to trust our own instincts, our own designs, our own desires, our own hopes. We rest in our own ability and strength and power. But what happens when something goes awry, when somebody lets you down, when you experience those hardships and difficulties? Jerry Sitzer writes in his book, A Grace Disguise, in a chapter entitled, Why Not Me? He says, most of us want control in our lives. And we succeed a great deal of the time, which is in due in part to the enviable powers Western civilization has put at our disposal. The possibility of so much control makes us vulnerable to deep disappointment when we lose control. Loss deprives us of control. Cancer ravages. Violence erupts. Divorce devastates. Unemployment frustrates. Death strikes, often with little warning. Suddenly, we are forced to face our limitations squarely. We resent the intrusion, the derailment. We never plan on loss. Our universe is hardly a safe place. It is often mean, unpredictable, and unjust, resulting in our asking the question over and over again, why me? That question is really easy to ask, isn't it? Why me? This isn't what I bargained for. This wasn't the way I understood that my life was going to be. I had a different outcome. This wasn't my understanding. Sitzer then goes on and states that an equally appropriate question for each of us today is why not me? Wars and plagues have claimed millions. Poverty and deprivation abound among millions more. Millions of others endure abuse. Systemic racism of one kind or another. He writes, my tragedy introduced me to a side of life that most people around the world know all too well. Even now, I hardly qualify as a tragic figure. Considering the good life I have been privileged to live for so many years, And even today, the accident was really a brief, albeit traumatic, interruption in an otherwise happy, secure, and prosperous life. So why not me? Why should I expect to live an entire lifetime free of disappointment and suffering? It's interesting. Current research on what makes people highly resilient has identified that expectations play a large role. Those who expect to suffer are not as traumatized when suffering comes as those who did not expect suffering. An adequate theology of suffering leads us to expect and prepare for it. We are then more able to rebound, and in essence, we have more elasticity, more resilience. And it's borne out in Scripture. We are not to listen to ourselves, but to listen to God. That's the A side. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He will make your paths straight. How about you say, my paths haven't been straight. You're telling me that I need this theology of suffering, and that, but, but my paths are going to be straight. At first blush, this passage seems to offer that wonderful condition. 
If only we trust God, if only we acknowledge him in our lives and we don't trust our own understanding, then we're going to have this wonderful straight path. No hiccups along the way, no surprises. Everything's going to go perfectly if we just love God hard enough, strong enough, with enough faith. There'll be no bumps along the way. Well, one thing about Proverbs is, is that they don't teach us promises They teach us principles. And the principle is, is that our lives can be straight, but it's not going forward. It's when we look backwards. And what we see is that God has been leading us and guiding us, directing us each and every way in such a way so that the rocky places are smoothed out. The crooked places have become a plane, and the twisted times have been straightened. We see the ways in which we've grown, in which we've changed, in which we've been transformed. We marvel and are amazed. God, you did this with my job loss. You did this with a time of marital discord. You did this in the midst of a devastating illness. How could you have straightened out that path in such a way so that it's become the most seminal points and parts of our lives that we couldn't do without There's an alternate translation that may fit a little bit better here. It says, and he will direct your paths. This is about listening to God and allowing him to direct and take all of the stuff of life that we've experienced and lead us onward. So these past few months have given me a lot of opportunity to think, and maybe they've given you that opportunity to think as well. And like I mentioned earlier, just kind of that whole scheme, I, that word resilience kept coming up and coming up. So what does it mean for us to listen to God and to be resilient? What does it mean to adapt to stressful life changes, to bounce back from hardships? What does it mean to respond to tragedy and to crisis and other life-altering changes? What does it mean for us to live in 2020? I mean, we forgot all about the murder hornets, and we still have elections that are coming up. So this is still 2020, folks, as much as we're wishing for January 1 to come. What does it mean to make our way through lives in our life in such a way that we we don't simply become unaffected or uncaring about life change, but rather join into it and to grow from it? A couple things I did slowly but surely over the past few months. I listened, was present more and more. I turned the TV off, started reading Lord of the Rings, deleted Facebook for a time. There was an initiative that we had at work in which we called everybody who had lost somebody in the past year. With all of the isolation was going on, and that just exacerbates the fact that not only are they isolated from loved ones that are living now, but it exacerbates the loss that they had and the isolation from the one that that's passed away. So we called. System-wide, we called over a thousand people. We called the families who we care for, the loved ones that we care for right now. I talked to my staff. I work in nursing homes. Nursing homes that have COVID units. And I see in the nursing home staff and in my staff the vacancy, the the weariness, the fear. And I listened to my neighbors, black, white, Asian police officers. And I listened to them, hurts, fears, thanksgivings, longings, joy. I allowed them to minister to me. I I listened for their resolve. I was present, still seeking to be that. 
also, I've taken my share of time to lament. I've asked that why me question, why us question, why has these times come to us question. I'll return to Keller for just a little bit. He was talking about resilience without stoicism. It doesn't mean we're unaffected or uncaring about life events. We lament what's taking place. He shares 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, one of my very favorite passages. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. The passage is not saying keep a stiff upper lip. Never let them see you sweat. Don't let it get to you. It's really calling us to feel the pain that we have in our lives. We're afflicted. We're pressed. We're perplexed. We're struck down. We're knocked flat. But we are not destroyed. But we allow ourselves to be in that perplexed and struck down and afflicted place for a little bit and cry out to God. The lament gives us permission to be struck down. But then, Paul in his writing, we don't stay there. 2 Corinthians 4 ends this way, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to the things that are seen, as we look, excuse me, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Resilience calls us to trust in those things that are unseen, to trust in God's leading and guiding. Resilience is not about gathering up our strengths. It's not just simply about plowing forward, but it's fixing our eyes on God. And so I started to read a little bit more of Scripture. In my reflections, I realized that what I thought I had in terms of resilience at the beginning of this year really wasn't so much resilience as that just everything was going really, really well. And as uh, we went through, started with this pandemic and, and every other concern that we've had, um, realized that I needed God. I, I've been working on my own understanding. I had been focusing on what I wanted in life, and I had not been looking to God. So I listened to him, started listening to him more, allowing him to minister to me. Started up more with the community Bible reading that we've been doing. And this week with 1 Thessalonians, once again, Paul is talking to the people of Thessalonica, and he's being resilient. He speaks in 1 Thessalonians about getting knocked down, but getting up again. He's always listening to God and not men, he says. His life was nothing but a straight path. If we learned anything from the study of Acts was that his path was very circuitous. His path was full of ups and downs. But his path was always focused on God, always focused on the gospel, always focused on the good news. And I started thinking about some of my favorite passages, reflecting on those once again. Joshua 1 be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It doesn't mean I'm going to be able to go outside and lift my vehicle. And it doesn't mean that God never gives us anything more than we can handle. It means that he makes us more. He's the one who strengthens us. 2 Timothy 1, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God speaking to Paul in the midst of struggle, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of crying out to have his thorn in the side relieved, he says, I am content now with weaknesses, insults, hardships, 
persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God is at work. Our lives are not a straight path. Following our designs and our paths would leave us hurting so many times, not understanding why it is that things have taken a turn. But it's interesting. As we look to how God is at work in our lives, we look to that seminal time of Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. It's the ultimate example for us of resilience. It is the power of God through the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And it's also the same power, Romans 8 and Ephesians 1, that will raise you and I from the dead. It's the same power that's at work in each and every one of us as believers. As he was raised, so are we. Resilience. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead has the ability to raise us. And it happens not by our own innate ability, not by our strength, not by our designs, not by our trust, but by the power of God working in our lives. I'm going to end here with just one more quote from the Lord of the Rings, but it's it's interesting. uh, uh, if you see any videos or seen discussions about Lord of the Rings uh, online, uh, they'll always question the plot line and say, why didn't they just send the eagles to drop the ring? Well, that's not the way God works. And that's not the way Tolkien worked. And that's not the way our lives work. And that's not what have made Middle Earth a better place. But it's in the struggle. It's in the journey. It's in the resolve. It's in the character. It's in the strength of what it takes. And Sam Wise, at the very end of the book, says this to Frodo. I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you that meant something even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories